Hi, everyone. Welcome back to day two of the Inclusive Theater Festival. Um, thank you all for being here. I am so excited to introduce our second speaker for the day. Um, we have Simone Prezini joining us. Simone is a multi-hyphenate actor born in Lima, Peru, raised in Dallas, Texas, and currently based in Los Angeles. They hold a BFA in acting. Sorry, that was the live stream. <laughs> As I was saying, Simone holds a BFA in acting and a minor in film production from DePaul University. Recent on-screen credits include Veil in the Pilot Wisdom, filmed at Chicago's Cine City Studios, and Gale in a Wedding to Diego, a queer rom-com shot in Portland, Oregon. Other than acting, Simone loves rock climbing, hiking, writing poetry, creating music, and generally moseying around in nature. Simone's passion for inclusion in media prompted them to found Vibes Video, a production company centering BIPOC, LGBTQ, and neurodiverse voices. They aim to tell stories rooted in authenticity, regardless of medium or genre. Recent productions include One of the Boys, a queer sitcom pilot, It's Alive, a comedic sketch, and The Lamp, a short drama. We're so happy to have you here, Simone, and welcome. It's all yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Simone Brazzini. Like our lovely host just said, I am a multi- Um, Simone, I don't think we can hear you very well right now. Could you repeat that maybe? Hi, Simone. Can you hear us? Um, yeah, I think you're muted right now. You, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, my Wi-Fi is back. Awesome. <laughs> so as I was saying, my name is Simone Brazzini. Like our host said, I am a multi-hyphenate creative. I am based in Los Angeles. I am primarily an actor, but I also write, direct, and create all different kinds of art and I'm here today to talk to you all about intersectionality in authentic storytelling and I have a lovely presentation if we want to share the screen Up. Great. So I created this little Canva thing. So what is intersectionality? Intersectionality acknowledges that people and groups can experience multiple forms of discrimination and oppression simultaneously, and that these forms of discrimination are interconnected and cannot necessarily be understood or experienced in isolation from one another. The term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. She used it to describe how Black women often face a unique set of challenges and experiences that weren't properly addressed by mainstream feminist or anti-racist movements. Overall, intersectionality recognizes that various aspects of a person's identity, such as race, gender, sexuality, class, disability, and more, intersect and interact to shape their experiences and social position. In addition to the multi-dimensional aspects of identity, other key points of intersectionality are interconnected systems, which emphasizes that systems of oppression, like I said, like racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, are interconnected and cannot be fully understood in isolation. Discrimination is not just additive, but it can be multiplicative in its impact. 
unique experiences. People with intersecting identities may face unique forms of discrimination and privilege that are not experienced by those with single unidimensional identities. Though I don't think anyone really has like a single or My back, it keeps closing out. Yep, you're back. I'm sorry, we might be facing some internet problems with Simone, but they will be back. Does it seem like I'm like leaving because on my end, my Zoom just like closes and then opens again? Yeah, I think you just like, it, it shows that you just leave the meeting and then come back in. Um, but that's okay. If you're good, you can keep keep going. Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you, Simone. Um, are you... So what I was talking about was the social justice aspect of intersectionality. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep, we can, yeah. Okay, so the social justice. Intersectionality is often used as a framework for social justice activism and policy advocacy. It encourages a more inclusive and nuanced approach to addressing social inequity inequalities. So to break it down, I'm going to use myself as an example. So I identify as non-binary, trans, queer, neurodiverse, and Latinx. So there are many times where maybe I'll be in a queer space, but I'll be the only non-binary or trans person there. And it can be difficult to connect or have a full experience because that intersection of my identity isn't fully recognized. And Similarly, if not more, when I'm in like Latinx sp spaces that aren't queer at all, then my queer and trans identity make it very difficult to feel accepted in the Latinx space because that culture is very binary and patriarchal. Overall, intersectionality has been very influential in various academic fields and social justice movements, helping to raise awareness about the complex and multifaceted nature of discrimination and inequality. It's used as a tool for understanding how different forms of identity interact and impact people's lives and experiences. And in theater or writing, film, you know, all creative mediums, it helps create art that all people can connect to. And it's something that's always there, you know, whether we think about it or not. We can go to the next slide. So what is authenticity? Oh, that was the slide. Okay, next slide. <laughs> One more. What is authenticity? So authenticity is a complex concept that refers to being true to yourself, your values, and your beliefs. It involves living in a way that aligns with genuine character and not pretending to be someone or something that you're not. Authenticity is Apologies for the issues to our audience. I'm sure someone will be joining us soon. So some key aspects of authenticity include self-awareness. Authenticity starts with a deep understanding of oneself. Uh, am I here? Yes. I think yes, it's just going to keep doing that, and I don't know why. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, um, if, if it keeps happening, okay. I mean, I'm not sure that so self-awareness. Yeah, I think we just, we just go, keep going, yeah.
Okay, I was going, okay. Self-awareness. Authenticity starts with a deep understanding of oneself, including one's values, beliefs, emotions, and motivations. It requires self-reflection and introspection, which not only takes time and energy, but can also change and fluctuate as your life goes on. Consistency. Being authentic means consistently behaving and presenting yourself in a manner that reflects your true self across various situations and contexts. Although to relate this back to intersectionality, sometimes people do need to code switch or mask in order to stay safe. And I think recognizing that you're doing that in the moment is also authentic. So code switching and masking doesn't mean you aren't living authentically. It just means that there's more than one way to be authentic given the given circumstances. Transparency. Authenticity involves being open and transparent about your thoughts, feelings, and intentions, especially to yourself. You don't need to like, be telling everyone your private thoughts or anything like that, but being transparent with yourself can be really valuable. Acceptance of imperfections, acknowledging your flaws and imperfections and not trying to hide them. Like the Zoom, all the flaws, I'm <laughs> not trying to hide them. Authenticity means embracing the humanity and the complexities of our human character. Now, that doesn't mean like you're never going to like not work on yourself. You just accept all your flaws and that's that no it just it means that you are in a state of radical acceptance and then you can make a conscious decision of you know no I'm okay with that aspect of myself or you know what this is something that I do want to change and improve and then take action from there self-expression authenticity encourages self-expression and the freedom to be who you are rather than conforming to social norms or expectations and again depending on your situation and environment it may not always be safe to do so, and that doesn't mean you aren't being authentic, but maybe finding places where you can be yourself or choosing to express yourself when, you know, it won't be dangerous, but maybe it can just feel scary. And you Okay, I switched to my phone's hotspot, so we'll see if that is better than the Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay, but I was on self-expression. So what I was saying is that maybe you might not feel safe to self-express in some places, and that doesn't mean you aren't being authentic, but maybe you can push yourself to find places where you can be yourself or choosing to self-express when it just feels a little bit uncomfortable, but you take that step because it's for you, which leads me to growth and change. Authenticity does not mean stagnation. You know, it allows for personal growth and change while you're staying true to yourself, you know, as you're evolving. It's also important to note that authenticity can be subjective and can vary from person to person. You know, what's considered authentic for one person may not be the same for another. You know, cultural, social, and personal factors all influence how authenticity is expressed and understood. But overall, in many contexts, being authentic is considered a positive quality. There's a power behind it. It leads to a sense of self-fulfillment, stronger relationships, and a more genuine and fulfilling life that informs the art that you do and create, as well as the art that you digest and experience and consume. However, achieving authenticity, if you can even achieve it, is a lifelong journey. It involves ongoing self-discovery and self-expression, and it can be scary and uncomfortable and emotional, but overall worth it. You can go to the next slide. So examples of authenticity in storytelling. I'll start with my own. So I recently wrote a feature film called My Name is Blue that features a non-binary, neurodiverse, and Latinx protagonist. And it's not autobiographical, but I used a lot of my own past experiences, the intersectionality of my identities to create a character that is messy and authentic and there were definitely moments in this that were difficult to write because I was taking from my own life, but I think it ultimately lent itself to creating a deep and heartfelt story. It's been three years in the making, but it's been received well critically, and I'm pretty proud of it, you know?
in terms of more uh, like famous or recognized works, there's the TV shows Fleabag and Rami, the Oscar winning movie Moonlight. In theater, you know, there's the classic The Raisin in the Sun, you know, almost like all of August Wilson's plays, The Laramie Project, the Broadway show Indecent. Now, all of these works were informed by real life experiences, you know, mostly the, the writers lived experiences that helped shape the art they were creating. Now, I would love to go around and share, all of you share uh, things that you, you've either personally created uh, you know, that were informed from your own lived experiences or something that you've seen recently that you just felt was very authentic. And you can either like raise the little uh, Zoom hand or you can just like unmute yourself and feel free to share. So just to recap for everyone, we're sharing an example where um, we've seen authenticity in some some kind of media. Um, so if anybody has any examples of that, please feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and share. Um, I could I could start us off. Yeah, Actually, go ahead. I saw I saw Indecent for the first time when I was working on it last nice. year at Northwestern. Um, nice. I was a sound op, but it was just such an incredible show. And for me, as someone who didn't know a lot about Jewish culture and Jewish history, it was just so wonderful to like see that intersection of of Judaism and the LGBTQ community and what that looked like in that time yeah um so it was just it was just super interesting to look at and it really gave me a perspective on um like like some be, even being a little controversial when showing like uh, like being authentically um true to yourself and to the story mm -hmm. that you want to tell yeah that's such a great example because you know obviously during that time like it was really hard for those in the Jewish community and it was also really hard for people in the queer community. So if your identity intersected in both of those things and like that shapes your experience so much more, you know, and then in creating this, the, the playwright, if you guys. Oh, Simone, I think your audio. are still so proud. So your audio mm -hmm. cut out, but then it came back. So it's fine. <laughs> Uh, all good. Do you want to repeat the last thing that she said, just so everybody can hear it? Yeah, just that. Um, even though we're in contemporary times, so this playwright wrote this story that is set in the early 1900s. Like so many of those themes are still so prevalent today, and that intersectionality and that authenticity just helps bring out so many layers of a play that's set back then, even though we're watching it in today's times. Does anybody else have anything that they like to share? Something that they watched recently or even something that they created themselves? Yes, Millie. Hi, um, I'm just, so I'm in an acting class with Ashna actually, and we're currently working on this project called the New Heritage Project. Um, and it's a little vague, I think intentionally, but it's, <laughs> it's asking us to create little like small pieces of movement or sound or speech that are about us and our heritage and who we are, whatever that means to us. So just something that I've been thinking about recently is like, what are the parts of myself that I want to share in my stories? And our teacher is also very clear on like that there are parts of yourself that you don't have to share. So finding those, mm -hmm. those places of authenticity has been really interesting to explore, especially because this is where we're starting our exploration of acting in the class. So I've had a lot of fun with that in the past couple of weeks. Great. I'm really, that's like such an awesome thing that your teacher has asked you all to do. And I think it is really important that like authenticity does not mean you're just like telling everyone everything about yourself. Like you can absolutely have boundaries and it's more of just like the exploration that you have within yourself and then choosing what you want to share with others. Because regardless, it's all going to inform everything. But I think that's lovely. And I'm glad that you're getting to have that. Um, Matt, Ia? Hi, yes. Um, 
So uh, something that I, I connected with recently um, in, a, in a class was um, a project called the Penelope Project. And um, it was sort of a um, multi-group project that involved a university, a, a local theater, I believe it was in um, Wisconsin, and a um, long-term care facility for elderly uh, people. And um, it was sort of a um, kind of a devised project that used the story of um, Penelope um, and Odysseus uh, from Greek mythology to kind of um, give these uh, folks in, in this long-term care home the uh, opportunity to sort of, um, you know, tell uh, tell stories and within that framework sort of tell their own stories. And it um, involved sort of also um, kind of a side plot that uh, involved memory loss, which is something that a lot of these um, people were mm -hmm. struggling with. And I think it just um, was something that really touched me because there were uh, so many people from so many different um kind of backgrounds and and um you know people from this university and from this um care home and from this local theater that kind of worked together and um helped you know really talk to each of these people um as individuals and talk to them about their lives and and um helped them sort of weave all of that into a story that they could um you know share with with their own community and with other people who came to to see the piece who maybe you know, had misconceptions or, or didn't often think about, um, you know, the lives and experiences of, of um, those elderly people living in a care home. And um, yeah, just it was a really cool example of sort of, I think, like collaborative art making and also, uh, you know, uh, authentic storytelling for a group of people who maybe don't have that opportunity often. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That sounds really awesome. And I think it, you know, devised work, absolutely, whenever you're creating both as an ensemble, you know, and taking from your life, that's always going to include authenticity. But I love how you share this because it also shows how authenticity can be empowering, you know, for these people who usually probably aren't creating theater very often uh, and have get to have this really unique experience. I, I loved hearing about it. Thank you. Um, Holly? Thank you. Um, I used to work in a in a liberal arts college, and I have seen four or five pieces self written about people on their trans journeys and how mm. how they made that decision and how their reactions from friends and families um, kind of affected them. And I found each of them to be very different and very very brave. Thank you. Yeah, I think that also highlights that even if people, you know, identify similarly with like the same quote unquote label, all our stories are going to be super unique and individual. And that's what authenticity is all about. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So bringing your full authentic self into your artwork. So showing up as your authentic self in your artwork can be challenging and deeply personal for a variety of reasons, you know, as people have already shared, you know, like vulnerability, authenticity often involves revealing your true thoughts and emotions and experiences, which can make you feel vulnerable, you know, sharing your genuine self can expose you to criticism or judgment. That's like, it feels like it's about you. And then it can lead to a fear of rejection, you know, there's a fear that your authentic work may not be well received by the audience or the critics. And, this fear of rejection can be a barrier to expressing yourself honestly. And, you know, especially like in, in larger contexts when money is involved, you know, if there's a producer, you have to think, is this going to be commercially viable? And when it's about yourself and you're being authentic, that's even scarier. And there's self-doubt, you know, doubting your own authenticity and whether your true self is interesting or worthy of artistic expression is a common hurdle that a lot of artists go through. And self-doubt can undermine your ability to be true to yourself and your work. Not to mention the social and cultural expectations, you know, societal and cultural norms and expectations can sometimes discourage authentic expression, leading to self-censorship. Someone might feel pressured to conform to what is considered more acceptable or more commercially viable. And then identity exploration. Being authentic in your art often involves exploring your own identity and values, which can be deeply introspective. And sometimes it can be an uncomfortable process because we haven't been to those places before. 
And then personal exposure, which we've talked about, sometimes we can be hesitant to share some of those more personal experiences because of privacy. However, despite these challenges, many artists, such as myself, such as these amazing stories that we've heard, find that creating authentic work is worth it and ultimately a magical way of creation because it provides genuine connection. Authentic art has the power to create a deep and genuine connection between the art and the audience and the artist, you know viewers and participants can sense the authenticity of the work and it can evoke a strong emotional response that resonates on a personal level it has more emotional impact you know authenticity in art often leads to a more profound emotional impact it can stir powerful feelings provoke thought and inspire reflection leaving an even more lasting impression on those who engage with it uniqueness Authentic artwork is inherently unique because it reflects the individuality and originality of the artists. It stands out always. It offers a, a fresh perspective and it makes it memorable and special. Empowerment, we, we just talked about this too. Creating and sharing authentic art can be an empowering experience for the creators. It allows you to embrace your own voice, your values, your experiences, and give a sense of control and self-affirmation. Catharsis. Many artists find that expressing their authentic selves and their work is a cathartic process. It can help release pent up emotions, heal from past traumas and find closure. Inspiration, authentic art can inspire others to embrace their own authenticity. It can serve as a model for self acceptance and encourage others to explore their own unique perspectives and creativity. Innovation, authenticity often drives artistic innovation when artists break free from societal norms and expectations, they can create groundbreaking, original, and thought-provoking work that pushes the boundaries of art and culture, resilience. Sharing authentic art can build resilience. It requires artists to confront their fears and overcome self-doubt, which can be transformative and empowering. And speaking of transformation, you know, both the artist and the audience can experience personal transformation through authentic art. It can change perspectives. It can challenge beliefs and inspire personal growth. So in essence, the magic of authenticity in art lies in its ability to transcend the superficial and touch the core of the human experience. You know, that's the underlying connection between every human being. <laughs> We're all humans. <laughs> and that has the power to bridge the gap between the artist's inner world and the external world creating those moments of connection and inspiration. Now, I would love it if we could take about a minute or two for everybody to write down, you know, whether that's like actual pen and paper or just on your phone. I would love it if you could each write down five things that you think make you, you. Now, it doesn't have to be things that like only apply to you and no one else, because that would be very, very hard. But just like the first five things you can think of that's like, hmm, this is me. So for me, that would be queerness, neurodiversity, creativity, fitness, and mental health. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be labels or identity or anything like that. It can be something that you like to do. Like, if you really love animals, you can just, like, write down animals, you know, or something that you like, like a color maybe, you know. Identity can be more personal, has some more depth. So if you are comfortable, I would love for you to go there. But really, any five things that you, the first five things that you can think of. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to do that, and then maybe we can share.
keep writing if you're still writing, but I would love us to go around and share if you're comfortable sharing. And I think we'll be able to see that maybe there's some overlap, but my prediction is that uh, no one will have all the same five things. And that this is sort of what intersectionality is all about, you know, where we can come together. And although we are all unique and individual, you know, it's how we can bring our full selves in a way that's, that fulfills ourselves, but also engages others and also connects, you know, whether you're a writer or a producer, a performer, a director, a behind the scenes person, or just like someone who enjoys the arts, I think we all benefit from being authentic with ourselves and our daily lives. So if anyone is ready to share, you can raise a little hand or unmute yourself. Yeah, um, I can go first. Um, I wrote queer, faith, science, dogs, and family. So that I, I didn't hear any of it. So if you mind sharing one more time or, or putting it in the chat because the audio is breaking up, but I oh, really- gosh, I'm sorry, I'll actually. write it. I'll write it in the chat. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, if, if anyone doesn't want to speak and just wants to write it in the chat, I can read it for you too, if that's something you're more comfortable with. I'll go ahead. Um, this is just any speaking. I wrote down indigenous, autistic, artistic, scientist, and accepting. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And then Monica's was queer, faith, science, dogs, family. Awesome. This is awesome. Thank you so much. I love hearing. Anyone else would like to share? No pressure. Just making sure that we have the space for anyone who wants to either vocally share or write in the chat. Um, I wrote storyteller, Jewish, creative slash curious. I couldn't pick on those. Um, sailor and family. Nice, nice. Thank you so much. We have Holly in the chat, grow independent, soist, outward facing introvert, reflective, lover of Japanese traditional arts. So cool. Thank you for sharing. I, I wrote down teacher. Oh, just lost it. <laughs> teacher, creativity, children, aunt, mature woman. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, so far, no one has had all five. <laughs> And there's actually been only a tiny bit of overlap. So I think that's really awesome uh, showing just how different we all are. Yes, Tessa and Ryan, Korean, Vietnamese, gay, introvert, creative. Love it. I love all the queerness in the room. <laughs> All right, if that is everyone, then we can go ahead. Oh, one more, yes, Kate. Mother, educator, wife, woman of faith, creative autism mama. Amazing, thank you so much for sharing. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Creative exercise. Thought you were done writing, but you're not. <laughs> okay, after hearing what other people put down, maybe you want to change yours. Maybe you want to add some, or maybe you want to stay the same. You know, it's all about reflecting, we're growing, expanding. Now, I would love it for you all to take three minutes to write creatively about something that intersects with the things that you wrote down. You know, 
it can be anything. It is, this is so this is super broad, open, vague. It can be just like free writing, like like a journal entry, you know, just whatever comes to your mind. You can write some like premises if you are someone who really likes to come up with stories. You can, if you immediately are like inspired, oh, I'm gonna just start the script. Like anything that you want to write, even if it's just bullet points of more free writing words, like things that don't necessarily connect. Just take three minutes. Whatever comes out, comes out. I'll I'll do it too. Uh, so yeah, three minutes from now, go, you can go ahead and write. It has been about three minutes. So if you want to go ahead and wrap up what you have written, we can take about five minutes to share. You can either like verbatim share what you wrote or you can just share what came up in a more broader sense when you thought about these five words that you chose. Um, I'll read word for word what I wrote because it was more of a, a free writing than a creative writing. I wrote, Neurodiversity and queerness and mental health all seem to intertwine. Most queer people I know have some sort of neurodiverse identity and or mental health diagnosis. But with creativity and fitness for me, these aspects of my life that are, are, aren't necessarily identity or diagnosis are the parts of my life that help me flourish. When I see all aspects of myself, I'm proud to be who I am. I may have struggled in the past, but my creative outlets the gym and rock climbing have all encouraged me to face my fears and embrace who I am. Um, so if anyone wants to share what they discovered, some thoughts, anything that they wrote down, feel free to raise your hand or unmute. I can go um, first. I wrote down, so one of my five words was um, Desi. And um, for me, I, I, I like my free write was about how I feel like the words that I choose would be different like two years ago um, mm. from to what they are right now. And I just like I was just thinking about how certain parts of your identity become salient when like depending on the context that you're in. So because I'm not 
in like when I was in India for 18 years of my life I never thought about being brown the same way I do when I'm here in the U.S. now mm. so I think that's just really interesting and um, it's cool to see how with time the idea like the parts of you that feel the most authentic change and kind of like yeah. come up to the surface in different ways um, yeah that's a little bit about my free ride thank you for sharing Anyone else want to share? Uh, this is Claudia's disembodied voice <laughs> reflecting on uh, my writing. And uh, the writing was about being, uh, um, um, embracing it's funny, I'm trying to sum it up and I'm like, should I just read it? How about I'll, I'll say this. The thing that I okay. wrote was about embracing the fact that I am a talkative introvert and <laughs> all of the things in my home are supporting my access needs. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate you sharing. Anybody else want to share? Great. I'll read for Mattia. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. RG, if you want to go first, and then I can read. Sure. Um, so one of the words I put down was story keeper, um, and that's what I wrote about. I'm a keeper of stories. I am sentimental. I worry that memories of something or someone will wash away and disappear. I keep things that belong to relatives that passed, beloved toys, old furniture, my father's baby shoes, my great-grandmother's glasses, photos of family members I don't even know, pictures of my nephews. This is how I feel the love and keep the love and remember. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. I really love that. Thank you so much. So Matthea wrote, some of my words included curiosity slash willingness to listen and learn, collaboration and compassion. My writing pertained to the ways in which I strive to bring those to others, but also I'm learning to bring them to myself. Lovely. Thank you. Anybody else feel called to share? No worries if not. All right, then we shall move on to the next slide. So this is a post exercise discussion. So we're not done talking, but uh, there's not going to be any more like writing. Um, but for this part, I would love if we could just sort of go into a more in-depth discussion, maybe about 10 minutes. We'll see. Maybe I think more five minutes. Um, I'll, I'm going to ask us some questions to get us started, but this is pretty open. So feel free to talk about anything that feels relevant or, you know, ask everyone who's here your own questions if you have them. But these are the questions that I have. How often do you see all of yourself represented in media? And do you want to see it? Would you want to watch something that's more intersectional and authentic? And do you see any potential problems with authentic storytelling? Could it also be a trap? Um, so those are just the questions that I'm posing. You don't necessarily have to answer any of these. Um, if, just, if it inspires a thought, feel free to share that. Um, I'm going to open it up to you all first and see if anyone has anything that they'd like to say from that. Yes, Millie. Uh, so something that I have just started thinking about with those questions is the like feeling of seeing people that are similar to you, but have different experiences. And I think that that's mm -hmm. what's super exciting to me about uh, theater that I see people being their authentic selves and theater where I see, or stories where I see myself uh, represented is that they're not me. They don't have the same exact yes. life story as me. They don't have the same experiences as me, but whoever is in that situation has something that I identify with. And I think that finding those places of um, like similarity and relating to characters and relating to stories that you see told is super exciting and beneficial because you get to see 
other people's stories and how they engage in the world. And you're not just mm-hmm. seeing how you would respond to something or how you would go through this scenario that's playing out. Yeah, it helps us expand our minds. You know, you have that thread. Uh, I can connect here, but then it grows and expands and branches out, which is like an awesome part of art. Anyone else have anything that comes to their minds? Um, This is Claudia's voice. I was thinking about how representation isn't enough. Mm-hmm. How oftentimes we will be, as marginalized people, invited into stories that were not written by us. Mm-hmm. And, and then we're, we're invited to represent a simulacrum of our experience. Um, so I, I love that I am today seeing more people who look like me, more people who in stories have a disabled experience, uh, more people who um, are Black. Um, but also sometimes I can tell that the writer and the directors don't come from my community. And so then I'm just seeing people telling stories that aren't authentic and it makes yeah. me feel more distanced. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I think, yeah, is it really, could it be considered authenticity if it's just the actors, you know, reflecting that? If it doesn't go deeper, like on a deeper level, like the writers, like I think it's important that everyone involved in a project on all layers, otherwise it's just performative. And I don't think that's something that everyone can connect to as much if it weren't informed on every level. So I I really thank you for saying that, Claudia. Anyone else have anything that they want to bring up? I'll say something if if um no one else. And I think this also relates back to intersectionality, you know, and how different aspects of our identities are informed in different ways. You know, there are some parts of our identity that we cannot even pretend to detach from, like it's immediate. And there are other parts of our identities that, you know, we can choose to share whether we want to or not. And it reminds me of this story. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the TV show Heartstopper, but the TV show Heartstopper is about two young queer boys uh, coming of age. And one of the lead actors upon joining the show was out and gay and everyone was like, yes, representation. And the other lead boy was not out. And so people presumed, uh, you know, to assume that he was straight. And so it was getting a lot of backlash of like, oh, why is this uh, queer character being played by a straight person? And the actor was getting so much hate and so much backlash that they were essentially forced to out themselves and they did end up coming out. Um, But they were barely 18 years old. And, you know, this show that blew up overnight, millions of followers, and all of a sudden now in the public eye, he's forced to come out. And, you know, I don't, I bring this up just to like, to, just to think about, just to bring something up about how authenticity, you know, we're all on our own journeys. We all think about it at different points in times and how we shouldn't pressure people, you know, to come to terms necessarily with their identities and how it is a lifelong journey and how representation in media is a sort of a back and forth, a give and take nothing is black or white, uh, n- you know, nothing can be only one thing or the other. Uh, and it is something that, you know, artists are still learning how to do, but also audiences are still learning how to come to terms with. Um, if anyone has anything that they'd like to respond to that, if that brought anything up for them, uh, please feel free to share. I teach uh, creative drama to kindergarten through fifth grade in Evanston. Um, And so I'm kind of looking at it as looking at all this about how it affects the young kids. Mm -hmm. Um, We just went to see the third grades, went to see a play at Northwestern. It was called Frida Libre about Frida Kahlo. And um, 
two things happened. One is that they sent us a pre pre video to watch before we went. And it was introduced by a young man who had been in our district all throughout his career, a student career, and also went to Northwestern and is now a professional actor. And I was talking to the kids about this guy because he was so exciting to watch. And one of the black boys in my room, he just, his eyes lit up and he was like, I, what? I could really do this. I could do this too. Oh, I love drama. And uh, it just gave me goosebumps. Um, yeah. I know it's a different level that we're talking here, but oh, it's no. so important. But then another, when we finished the play, I had one group of kids write letters to the actors, um, just what they learned, what they thought. And one of the girls in my class is a Latina, and she wanted to write to the actress playing Frida. She knew her name. She remembered her name from the, the talkbacks. And she wrote this beautiful letter about how she was so touched with this woman's performance and I knew that she, it deep in herself she was seeing that she was identifying with her and that's so so I mean I know it's always been special but I was really reminded how terribly it's special it is for these children to see this happening um you know in tv movies plays books everything so yeah thank you for sharing that I think especially with kids you know growing up you know, kids of all identities, whether it is race or sexuality or disability, you know, at least like five, 10 years ago, all we grew up seeing was just straight, white, cis, able-bodied, like North Book, like that's all we saw. And so you sort of like, there's the shame that comes around like, oh, like then this other part of me isn't normal because TV, theater, movies are such a big part of our culture. Uh, but I love, I love that these kids got to see that. And I love all this new stuff that's coming out so that the next generation and so on and so forth can really start, that authenticity can start from a younger age so that there is less shame and that we can talk about it more. Um, we can go on to the next slide. I'm not sure we have time to go on to do a full discussion of the next slide, but I just want to raise these points. So we talked about, watching more intersectional stories. Um, and we talked about, you know, kids seeing themselves. And also, I just want to raise the point, I think someone brought it up earlier a little bit about watching stories that differ from us too. You know, because if we only ever watch stories that reflected our own experiences, we would never grow or appreciate others. And so I think it's important to have that balance of, of seeing yourself represented on screen so that you know that you are worthy of everything. And then also seeing other people so that we can learn and grow and expand as human beings. Um, so I'm going to pose these questions. I don't think we have time to answer them, but just think about them as you go on with the rest of the day. And it's how often do you watch content with people that have vastly different experiences from your own? If you don't, why not? And has learning about other people today made you change your mind about that at all? Um, so just things, you know, next time you go on Netflix and you click on something to watch, whether you change what you watch or not, just ask yourself, hmm, what brought me to watch this? Are the people on the screen exactly like me? What can I do to expand that? If I want to, you don't necessarily have to, um, and we can go to the next slide. So closing remarks, you know, we all have unique identities. We should spend time getting to know ourselves. If we haven't spent too much time doing that, it can be scary and vulnerable, but great things come from that, you know, especially all the works of art that we talked about today, all our beautiful intersectional identities. Everyone is so different and so awesome, and I love it. Uh, and we're all brave, and we all have stories worth telling. Even if we aren't necessarily writers, we all have those stories worth telling. So I really just want to thank you all for being here, for bearing with technological difficulties at the beginning. I really appreciate you all, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Thank you so much, Simone. Thank you for being here with us today and for all of those amazing exercises. I personally really enjoyed them and I'm sure everybody did too. Um, that's our second speaker for the day, everyone. Uh, Simone Pizzini, thank you so much. Um, we will be returning. We, we're going to break for lunch now and we will be returning at around 2 p.m. Um, for a short and quick networking session um, with our next presenter at 2.30 p.m. So please start joining the call again at 2 p.m. I will be ending the call for now and restarting it at that point of time. Um, we have Sins Invalid, a wonderful performance collective coming to present at 2.30 p.m. Um, and I'd love for all of us to be there. But thank you so much, everyone. And I will see you in a little more than an hour. Thank you.